I'm going to turn off the render region and try and focus solely on the render tree for a moment so I can actually get rid of the show hide preset menu and work from here. All I really need is the nodes that are connected to the 2D gradient along with the 2D gradient included in this compound. I do want the ability to mix it in later on with my shader, uh, my texture shader here, but this is the node that I want to be represented by a single node in my in my graph or the render tree. So I'm going to middle click to select the 2D gradient and its children descendants, uh, right click on the compound and create a compound. Now right away I have a much simpler interface except I have no attributes exposed when I double click on the shader to open up a PPG uh, or I don't have any inputs that I can map into um, and manipulate directly. Also the name isn't very descriptive. So I'm going to dive into the shader compound by editing it. Again if you visualize it you can see exactly how it would be viewed in a shader ball so that's very handy. I'm going to edit the shader and just like working with ice, we have the same type of functionality as the ice tree does. So I need to actually control a few attributes here. So on the texture projection, I don't really need to, to deal with anything at this point. So I can leave that. And if I look at the 3D warp, I really need to control just the intensity and scale of the warp. So I'll expose those inputs. We'll call that warp intensity and warp scale. And as far as the kaleidoscope goes, we do want to be able to drive the coordinates as well as the number of reflections. So we'll call that the kaleidoscope coordinates and number of reflections. Well, you can just call it kaleidoscope number of reflections. That'll be self-explanatory there. And in incidents, we want to be controlling the bias and gain, as well as the ability to invert the incidence. Well, this is really helping us to control the angle of the kaleidoscope, uh, kaleidoscope shader as its effect on noise using the fold operator. So I'll also expose the ability to invert that. So let me make sure that we know what this is. Incidence bias and incidence gain. And the invert self explanatory there. The next areas that we look at uh, exposing would be things like the color of the cloud shaders and the contrast if we wanted to go into that level of detail. For now, I could actually just go in and set just maybe the cloud color as, as an access uh, as an access point. But I'm going to simplify this to show you a little bit more about how we're going to transition the colors over time, sort of an expanding decay of the leaves, using the simple color 1, 2, 3's first before implementing the 3D cloud. So uh, I'm going to temporarily just disconnect these and use the 2D gradient to demonstrate. Again, all of these changes will remain uh, persistent in the compound when I export it. So when I actually drag the compound back into my graph, I can hook these up again and functionality be, will be restored. So I'm going to call this my radial wave gradient. And I'll export it. So you can see right away in that compound, it hasn't been renamed yet because we haven't exported it here, but we do have access to all of the inputs. So I'll export that compound, and you'll notice I've already got one, a warped radial gradient. I've gone through two iterations of it already, so I'll just save a, uh, a new one here. And I could always just bring that uh, warped radial gradient in. If you look under shader compounds, there's my user compound right there. So I'm at a 2.0 and I just have this connecting to the surface uh, input when I was uh, prototyping it. So one of the neat things that I did with this warped gradial gradient shader is that I accessed the position of the sliders. Now if I jump back into the shader compound for a moment, one of the difficult things about working with the 2D gradient, if I just draw a render region here, and let me hook this right into the
diffuse attribute, so I don't have any blending to deal with. One of the difficult things of dealing with an expansion, if I wanted this green to expand outwards uh, to transition to yellows and reds, is that I have to do it, if I dive back into my compound, through the 2D gradient. And gradients have always been tricky in XSI to work with because you actually have to, on a per color slider uh, level, adjust the position. So this refers to the position of the slider for this particular input. And you can see how you can shift it around. If I move it this way, I can grow my, my gradient. So that becomes very tricky, but with the way compounds work, I can actually just map into position color 1, position color 2, position color 3 separately as scalar sliders, much as the inputs would dictate. So if I expose input of position color 1, and perhaps the color as well, so let's map color 1 and the position. So I don't know why it says color 2, but let's just rename that. We'll call it color. And this would be position for the first color. We'll call this color 1. And position color 1. And finally, we'll get uh, color 3 and position color 3. Which is actually color 2. And position color 2. Okay, so there are only three colors in my gradient, so that's all I really need to deal with. And now when I uh, close down this editor and re-export my compound again, I'll just re-export it as over top of the old one, I now have the controls for managing the position color as well as the color at position. So when I minimize the material manager now, it's really nice to be able to go in and just work my gradient in this kind of a manner. So th through the power of compounding, I'm actually increasing access to these tools. So let's, let's actually look at animating this now.